I am Professor Barbara Wallace, and I'm professor here at Teachers College, as well as Director of Health Equity for the Center for Health Equity and Urban Science Education, abbreviated CHOOSE. And it is the CHOOSE, or our center, that is proud to host this event, which is a 400-year 1619 to 2019 event and live stream at Teachers College Clem University. Our theme today is repercussions of 400 years of oppression and violence and a contemporary approach to violence prevention with urban youth. We're going to begin our program by acknowledging our additional sponsors we're very happy that the Department of Health and Behavior Studies is one of our sponsors providing funding for this live stream. In addition, we're delighted that the Institute for Urban and Minority Education, UMI, here at TC, is yet another sponsor. And of course, the program that I direct is a sponsor, and that would be the programs in health education and community health education here at Teachers College Community, Teachers College Columbia University. We're going to begin with uh, a bit of a cultural opening in the tradition of West Africa. And that is an opening libation by the Akumfohini. Akumfohini means King Shaman. And that is Nana Karantama Ayabwafo. And Nana Karantama Ayabwafo is president of the Suna Abarati Shrine incorporated in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and she is representing the ancient spiritual tradition of the Nene Akonedi Shrine in Latte, Ghana. Uh, Nana is also the founder of her own NGO, non-governmental organization and nonprofit, which is Star Spirit International Incorporated. So without further ado, we will have our opening libation by the Akonfohini. Atanansio pe Nana me ye watanansio Atanansio pe Eja me ye watanansio Atanansio pe Ahinibafwe ye watanansio Atanansio pe Eja me ye watanansio Atanansio pe Oh, as I see Jin Sanum, Nanon Yemi Jin Sanum, Nano Paribia, when I would dom Jin Sanum ya, in a one Pampa Sudi, I sue ye the pebre, while thou roma Jin Sanum, Quack Wadeco Jin Sanum, then Suyal Jin Sanum, Nano Compo any me, or Compo a coma henny, Jin Sanum ya, in a one O Tutu, Jin Sanum, Tanoko Jo Jin Sanum. Krachi dente jin sanum konkom bejen sanum abusiana na jin sanum wada rumo na ye freba kwa na ye fremunye na se yampa ene ye bai e ye sana o hema jiri wacho sumi enu ono ne o invite ye se ye bebo yampa ye ne inti wada rumo ye wo teachers college Columbia University aha na ye pesa wuna udom. Bedi nechi na mbwaye na semne yebeka ma semi na koso ohodine ni munyem sika inkwa wada uruma ni pa boni vo na semoni bi ada hona ni yeye yefre wo se prani fi ye kwanso na ma sa program na yeye se si ya koso ewo bebi ya anti wada uruma ye sre sre wo eno pei eriye anajo fei se wuna wudom wunye na di na semama yo. I'd like to translate and give a commentary on what was said. I poured the libation in the tree language. Um, that is uh, the language spoken by most Ghanaians who go to school. They learn the tree language. And it is an ancient tradition from Ghana that I'm representing, as Dr. Wallace said earlier. So the first part of the libation was a summonsing that all the higher energies that surround us, all of the intelligences that, um, that we're able to access, that they should open the way 
for this program that, is, that has been called uh, together here at Teachers College by Dr. Wallace and her colleagues, that they should come and open the way so that the information that is shared is valuable, that everyone gains a true understanding of the message that comes forth from the information that each presenter gives today. Also, I ask that those of you that are in, in attendance, that you are successful in all of your endeavors throughout your life so that your careers can blossom and that this is information that you can share with others and that will give you a greater insight into what is going on in our world. I also ask that the divine spirit, that the creator provide a healing energy for each and every one in attendance today so that those ancestors that I called by names can also rally around and make sure that there's more harmony here at Teachers College, that you have prosperity in your lives, that you have uh, good health, longevity, good sense, and that there be harmony in your homes so that the information that is shared today, that we receive it openly and that all things that are done are done to improve our human condition here on planet Earth. And that was the libation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We're very grateful. Um, I need to inform you that uh, Professor Christopher Emden experienced flight delays, that he's having serious flight issues and sends his sincerest apologies for not being able to be here with us, which of course means that those of us who uh, tend to be long-winded, such as myself and Professor Fully Love, uh, have more time. <laughs> so indeed, we consider it to be uh, providence indeed. So uh, I'm waiting for uh, media services to provide me with uh, the setup for my PowerPoint. Uh, oh, it is up there. So what do I do? I just advance it here or something? Let's see. Does that work? Oh, oh you're going to advance it for me. All right, go back to the first slide then. And good to see you. And good to see all of your beautiful faces. Some of you are familiar from some of the past events that the center has sponsored. And I'm just really grateful that you were able to make it out in the rain today. So uh, I'm going to be speaking for longer than a half hour uh, about the US culture of violence and racial cultural skill acquisition for coping with the stress of racism. And it probably makes more sense for me to, uh, to use a mic. Yes. So, as opposed to me looking over my shoulder, I can have the advantage of a certain amount of freedom. And I guess that's really what this event is all about. It's all about freedom in many respects. Even as we are acknowledging that it was in 1619 uh, that is designated as the time when upon the shores of Virginia, uh, the first Africans who were to experience enslavement arrived, uh, and that indeed up until today, we can acknowledge that we are still experiencing what constitutes 400 years of violence and oppression I chose these images with great care, and we can actually go to the, uh, the next slide, because when we think about the United States culture of violence, these images, go to the next slide, actually sum it up pretty well. That we can see in what for many are rather graphic, emotionally stirring images, the experiences that uh, those who were descendants of Africans and those who were uh, snatched from her shores, experienced. And so if we go to the upper right corner, we can see the experience of those who were put into the belly of slave ships. We see how they were packed like sardines. 
Uh, I don't know if many of us have had the experience of not being mobile uh, and being in close quarters so that those who were uh, basically uh, having their bowels emptied or were on their menses or were vomiting because they were seasick uh, or were giving birth uh, in the belly of slave ships, that these are all the things that occurred in these very tight, cramped quarters. Uh, and, and indeed, we can then look at the symbol of the whip, and this is a very uh, popular, although popular probably isn't the right word, but many of us have seen this particular image that captures how uh, slaves were whipped. Uh, they were indeed treated uh, as uh, chattel. And then we can go to yet another era where the noose became a very powerful symbol. And it is the noose uh, that is associated with lynching. And uh, I chose this particular crop because I didn't want to include the gentleman on the right who's laughing that these were events, that we need to appreciate that lynching was in fact a tradition that uh, has been passed on across generations. Uh, and then we can go down and see civil unrest of the 60s and, we can, and I chose, uh, in particular, the image of a woman who was being beaten, as opposed to what we might recall as dogs being sicked on those who were in the South protesting, or water hoses that were sprayed upon them. But it was the police baton that was responsible for cracking skulls, and so blood flowed yet again in the street. And then we come to the New York Police Department in a modern era, and so we now enter into the echoes of the mass incarceration crisis, that we can acknowledge that it was in states like New York in the 1970s, where harsh Rockefeller drug laws, for example, were passed that contributed to this state's mass incarceration crisis, while it was in 1985 that the Drug Abuse Act was passed, and 1986 a yet more severe Drug Abuse Act was passed, so that there were mandatory minimum sentences, such that uh, you know, if you happen to be someone who was smoking crack cocaine, then you would face a uh, hundred times, in other words, it would take a hundred times more the, of that drug, of uh, powder cocaine, to trigger the same mandatory minimum sentence. It's kind of like, uh, I like to give this example. Imagine uh, being, um, walking down the street with a McDonald's bag with a hamburger and french fries and a Coca-Cola, uh, and you're going to get a mandatory minimum sentence that is quite severe, uh, yet someone else who has an entire grocery cart, you know, with uh, 10 pounds of raw hamburger meat and, you know, 20 pounds of potatoes that haven't been cooked up yet and a gallon of oil and, you know, dozens of hamburger buns, that that person would get a slap on the wrist and would not face the same mandatory minimum merely because the food was not yet cooked up. So if you talk about powder cocaine versus its cooked up version of crack cocaine. But even this image isn't even invoking all that. We don't need to have any of that. You could be a Columbia University student who is facing police brutality. And it's important to see that here we have a woman, that's a woman in the middle, so that we're going to understand today how it is that, and it could very well have also been uh, a Puerto Rican or an African American police officer who might be engaged in this kind of police brutality, because we're going to understand today how social conditioning occurs so that it is a woman or it is someone of color who is also participating in what becomes a tradition in the United States cultural of violence, which is to release violence, physical blows, against those who are people of color. And here we're focusing today in particular upon those who are descendants of Africans within this 400 years of oppression and violence. And of course, what are the repercussions, the ultimate symbol of the mass incarceration crisis? Uh, this is a small crop of a long line of youth who are incarcerated uh, in the ever so symbolic orange jumpsuit. And then we come to the era that much of what Professor Emden was going to talk about touched upon, and that is the empowerment of youth and the way in which hip hop culture 
represents really youth culture, and it's become a global culture, and how it's very much about the empowerment of youth. And so we see that in these last two images with uh, an event having the no youth in prisons so that it's also an era of activism. So this really captures the 400 years of oppression and violence, and today we're going to focus on a contemporary approach to violence prevention with urban youth. Let's go to the next slide. So what is this United States culture of violence? Well, it turns out that uh, at the height of the crack cocaine epidemic in 1993, I was asked by a government agency to basically write what they called a white paper, which was a critical analysis. And they really wanted to understand the nature of the violence that was very much a part of the crack cocaine epidemic and also the uh, mass incarceration crisis that was occurring, as they were an agency that was serving families that were impacted by that epidemic. And so I basically took the task and defined the United States culture of violence. And so we can conceive of United States culture of violence as a way of life. It's a way of life. It involves specific behaviors, beliefs, practices, and traditions that are taught and transmitted from group member to group member and from generation to generation regarding the use of force, displays of power, and the spreading of misinformation and myths so that the exact same violence that we see during the 60s civil rights era is the same violence that we see in the new millennium. That is the same tradition, it is the same beliefs uh, that support the degradation of those who are of African descent that drives this violence. And so we are gonna to understand today how the use of force and displays of power uh, and also the spreading of misinformation and myths, negative stereotypes, things that just are not true, are a core component of the US culture of violence. Next slide. And then we can also understand how what is at the core of this United States culture of violence is a process of transmission. It's the transmission of practices and traditions regarding violence, and it occurs in such a way that historically traumatic events continue to profoundly shape and impact what's transmitted to different cultural group members across generations, and this transmission occurs today. Um, I often joke that all an immigrant has to do is come to the United States and watch television for one week, and they will know which group they are free to denigrate, which groups, which, which people of color it is okay to denigrate and to unleash violence upon. And so these images really capture the nature of the trauma, the nature of the violence that has been a part of this 400 years experience in this country. Next slide. And this definition of the cultural violence includes the historical destruction of Native American civilization, the existence of the slave trade, violence against newly arrived immigrant groups, which of course we see today, children in cages, and the codified degradation of African Americans. So again, those images capture it. And of course, with my really mentioning our Mexican uh, immigrants, Mexican Americans, who are also taken <laughs> as newly arrived immigrants as well and suffer this kind of violence, then we begin to feel a lot of emotion. Next slide. And so this definition includes the subsequent forms of more contemporary forms of institutionalized racism. So today we talk about structural racism. We talk about the manner in which our institutions basically embody the belief, the tradition, the way of life that basically accepts the degradation and the unleashing of violence against people of color, and here we're talking about African Americans. So it's an historically sanctioned discrimination and violence, and it's especially practiced against people of color. And guess what? This is the context of our lives here in the United States. This is the context of our lives. Next slide. And so we can understand that there are stereotypes that are learned 
Uh, in terms of what is transmitted, we can think of stereotypes. Uh, and these stereotypes are learned thoughts. So for those of you who took at least an introductory psychology course, you've heard about conditioned. So conditioned merely means learned. Conditioned, so these are learned thoughts. The big word for thoughts is cognitions. So we can talk about learned thoughts or we can talk about conditioned cognitions. They are one and the same. So when I say, going forward, conditioned cognitions, you're gonna think, learn thoughts. Very good, all right. And so these learned thoughts are transmitted from group member to group member, from generation to generation, and they effectively are spreading misinformation and myths. Next slide. And so we're talking about a socialization process. And it occurs in the larger culture, it occurs through mass media, it occurs through social media. I mean, today we hear debates about what Twitter or what Facebook should take down. Uh, when is that line crossed so that they're clearly spreading messages of hate? They're clearly spreading messages of, of, uh, that are truly myth. But this is how this socialization process occurs up to today. Uh, and it also occurs in the family context, through our religious groups, through our own ethnic cultural groups. One of the ways in which I like to emphasize this is to tell a little dinner time story. So some of you may know about Archie Bunker uh, and the kind of things that Archie Bunker might say, but I would suggest to you that all of us had interesting experiences seen around the dinner table. And of course, we can talk about uh, those families that are so poor uh, that there is no dinner table. So the, even that tradition, uh, as a result of some of the violence and oppression, is not something that everyone has experienced because of severe poverty. But imagine that you are growing up and you're sitting around the dinner table. And if you happen to be Puerto Rican, then it may very well be that your parents are degrading in casual conversation before you at age five, seven, 10, 11, 12, 20. They are degrading Dominicans or they are degrading Cubans. And if you happen to be at the Dominican dinner table, well, they are doing the same thing. They are degrading Puerto Ricans. They are degrading Cubans. If you're at the Cuban dinner table, they are degrading Dominicans and Puerto Ricans. If you're at the Mexican American table, well, they're probably really loving. No, but the idea is that you can see how once they've been in this country long enough, they realize that it's time to uh, assume that tradition. They likely are denigrating those who are also treating them badly. Uh, the Irish are denigrating the Italians. The Italians are denigrating the Irish. If it's the African-American dinner table, they're talking badly about the West Indians or the Caribbeans. If it's the Caribbean dinner table, they're talking badly about the African-Americans, et cetera, et cetera. And, oh, it is only it is only the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who are truly enjoying their dinner, except the women are silent, okay? So uh, the idea is that it's through this socialization process that we all emerge brainwashed. We all possess these socially conditioned cognitions. And so if we were to do a free association test and mention a particular group, you would probably automatically, and maybe with some embarrassment and shame, uh, immediately think of the negative stereotypes that are associated with that particular group. And of course, with uh, I couldn't go on forever with that little story, so. But every, it, it was meant to be inclusive of everyone. Okay, so the next slide. So our socially conditioned cognitions lead to behavior. Cognitions guide behavior. And so whether it's engaging in the behavioral practices and traditions, and again, I wanna emphasize how this is truly a tradition that police departments have passed down from group member to group member, generation to generation. And it occurs against members of ethnic, racial, gender, class, sexual orientation, disability, and other varied, different, diverse and different groups. Okay, so it's not just the police. The idea is that all of us in society are, are engaging in behavior that is a, a product of our cognitions, our learned thoughts, lead to our behavioral actions. Next slide. And so now we can turn to a broad definition of violence. Can you just go back one slide? Let me just make sure. Go back one more. Okay, great, we're, we're, it's okay. Keep going. 
Okay, so I also offered a very broad definition of violence. So how do we understand this violence? First of all, some of it is overt, such as like physical blows. Some of it is covert, such as the spreading of misinformation and myths. Okay, uh, imagine uh, being in the locker room and uh, seeing a noose bought in and hung on one of your coworkers' lockers, okay? Or their doorknobs. We won't go into any more detail on that one. Uh, but the idea is that there are some forms that are covert or a swastika, for example, being put on someone's door. But the idea is that violence is defined as delivering physical blows with or without weaponry displaying and misusing one's power. And so, of course, we've seen some examples of that that have been discussed at length in the media recently. Or bombarding a person with destructive misinformation and myths so that, in effect, an assault occurs. We're talking about an assault that's occurring uh, either on a person's physical body or to the self-concept or to their identity or to their cognitions, affects, which is a fancy word for feelings, and their consciousness. So we're talking about an assault that can occur upon one's consciousness. And the idea is that this is a frequent experience of those who are historically marginalized. And so whether it's covert or overt, all forms of violence must be exposed and rejected. And so let's go to the next slide. And so now we can talk about how we effectively learn our ABCs. It's not just ABCs that we learn in kindergarten or preschool or Head Start, if we're lucky enough to experience that. But all of us learn a set of ABCs. So we're going to talk about how our socially conditioned cognitions can lead to affects or feelings of hate, disdain, fear, envy also. Uh, and then we can have socially conditioned cognitions that lead to behaviors of violence. And so now let's talk about our ABCs. These socially conditioned cognitions can lead to affects. They can lead to behaviors. And so we learn our ABCs. And these ABCs sustain our culture of violence. Uh, in other words, I'm trying to make it real simple, uh, as I will in terms of potential solutions. And so these ABCs are transmitted nationally and globally, particularly with the benefit of mass media and the web. Next slide. So we all learn our ABCs, uh, affects of hate, behaviors of violence, discrimination. Uh, part of what I like to talk about in terms of the behaviors, particularly when training those who may be working uh, in various fields, whether education or healthcare, that one of the ways in which we suffer involves behaviors of discrimination. And I'm gonna talk about discrimination as being the equivalent also of a failure to follow a standardized protocol. So for example, if you present certain symptoms of heart disease, there may be a standard protocol uh, that a doctor is supposed to follow, whether that is to give a certain kind of stress test, et cetera, that there are protocols that exist in many different fields. There are protocols for what you do when, for example, uh, a little girl uh, who's 10 or 13 in elementary school uh, basically does not comply with uh, what the teacher has asked them to do. And the standard protocol does not include calling the police and body slamming that little girl onto the ground, okay? So that's when we begin to see the impact of our cognitions, these stereotypes that have been uh, imparted uh, so that this kind of violence, and so we really have what begins to, to be an epidemic in terms of the expansions and suspulsions, uh, <laughs> that's interesting, the suspensions and expulsions that are occurring at much higher rates for our black boys and girls. And many of us may not know, but there is a particular crisis involving our black girls who are being suspended and expelled at these high rates. So when we have zero tolerance policies in our schools, and these zero tolerance policies are enacted in such a way that it is not fair, that it is discriminatory, that the standard protocol is not being followed, 
when we're talking about that protocol of not being followed in healthcare, and then we're talking about disparities in healthcare service delivery, which can contribute to disparities in health. And then we also have um, our cognitions, which are our learned thoughts. And so the challenge is transformation. So this ultimately has to enter us into a message of healing and hope. Okay. And so let's go to the next slide. How can we transform personally? Well, one way that we can transform is to learn a new set of ABCs. We have to shift from these old socially conditioned, maladaptive, we will say, we will call these old con cognitions that are maladaptive. Um, and for example, we can start with what is an example of a maladaptive affective or a feeling? Well, we talked about that, hate, disdain. And so we have to personally shift to those adaptive affective responses, which I like to summarize by asking you, who are you? It's a challenge for your own personal transformation. Who are you? Are you someone who can interact with someone who is different from you, with the diverse and different, with affects of A, acceptance, respect, and empathy, A-R-E, who are you? And I would say that the most important of these is actually respect. People want to be respected. It's actually a higher order experience for you to be able to accept someone who is different from you. But that is ultimately the goal. And if we are truly to fulfill our capacity to be human, if we are truly to express our humanity, then empathy, to be able to empathize. How can you see children in cages at the border and not have a human response of empathy? How can you not see children and not have an experience of respect for basic human life? How can you not imagine what it might be like to be in Guatemala and to be experiencing violence, to be experiencing death threats, to have members of your family killed? How can you not begin to accept that someone might experience walking a long distance as a justifiable response given the human will to survive? And so might we begin to experience that? And of course, to go back to our African Americans, we can talk about, we, we could probably take up five minutes going from Sandra Bland uh, to all of those who have been murdered and also ask, where, when are we going to begin to have the kind of training for police? And we like to think that it has begun in places as well as of prosecutors and we like to think it has also begun in places where they're now looking at African Americans uh, with acceptance, respect, and empathy. And then we also have to personally shift from our old socially conditioned, and again, maladaptive behaviors, to new behaviors where we adhere to standard protocols. We adhere to behaviors of civility, and we believe that it is appropriate to behave in such a way that it results in access, equal access to opportunity, fairness, as well as all that is involved in non-discrimination. And then our third C, as we learn a new set of ABCs, we have to shift from old socially conditioned, maladaptive cognitions to new cognitions. And so as opposed to those learned thoughts, those stereotypes, might I sit across from you might I interact with you as an equal human being? And might I instead have the cognition, I seek to see and know you. I inquire and I listen. And for those of you who uh, have been studying cultural competence for a long time, the newer trend is to really talk about cultural humility. And this is the essence of cultural humility. Are you able to sit across from someone as a nurse, a physician, a teacher with a parent, uh, are you able to seek to know and inquire and listen as you express this value of having cultural humility and knowing that 
You cannot even in cultural competence training reduce all of our different cultural groups to a set of stereotypes. You cannot reduce Trinidadians, Jamaicans, Caribbeans, Haitian Americans, African Americans of various, uh, uh, from various geographic regions with varying levels of education, with varied values. You cannot reduce them to stereotypes. You have to appreciate the heterogeneity that you will find in various populations. And the only way that you're going to access it is to seek to know, to inquire, and to listen, to have this cultural humility. Next slide. And then we can also talk about something that I advanced in 2003, which was the psychology of oppression, which of course was accompanied by a psychology of liberation, identity development. But the psychology of oppression part acknowledge something very key, that a part of this socialization process is that you can take any actor A, and guess what? They're socially conditioned to feel superior. They're socially conditioned to feel superior, and we see a lot of that going on. Um, I will skip the image that came to mind for sake of time, but then there's actor B who is deemed inferior and indeed socially conditioned to feel inferior. And this is the core dynamic. I actually have several dynamics, but this is the one, next slide, that is of the three, this is the one that is perhaps gets to the heart of the matter. And that is that under the psychology of, of oppression, there's this old paradigm. And you can see that it's symbolized with a little equation, A over B, or A slash B. And this suggests that the person, the actor in position A, is superior or deems himself superior to the, position, the person in position B. And under the psychology of oppression, this is known as domination, hierarchical control, oppression. Uh, and what happens? We have the conditions for a culture of violence. You have the conditions for any new refugee group, any new immigrant group, all being thrust into position B. We have models of learning that we are attempting to get beyond, which basically we're preparing perhaps people to work in factories in prior centuries. Uh, we have what many religions have also reduced their flock to, position B, A over B. So those are the conditions for perpetrating, in many instances, injustice, inequity, health disparities. And so a part of the personal transformation that you're being urged to pursue is to shift to the new paradigm. And the new paradigm can be summarized very briefly as A equals B. Or it's the psychology of liberation and identity development. And here we have non-hierarchical equality. And these are the conditions for social justice, equity and health for all freedom, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And so there are many of our youth, our empowered youth, who are not gonna tolerate anything other than A equals B, even as they are slammed to the ground, even as they may be handcuffed, even as they may be suspended and expelled at unfair, uh, disproportionate rates. Next slide. And so the research group on disparities in health has a symbol and this is it, and it's, it's, it, it suggests the imperative that we all, personally, the organizations to which we belong, our whole societal culture, in fact, needs to shift from inequity in health to equity in health. It's really about a global movement. And so we need to stop hierarchical, A over B, domination, oppression, all those old ways of thinking, behaving, and we need to foster and live A equals B, which is this non-hierarchical equality with new ways of thinking, acting in the world. And it's really a call for a 21st century global civil rights movement for equity and health for all. Next slide. And so now we can move on to a discussion of racial cultural skill acquisition for coping with the stress of racism. How do we cope? How are we to cope with the reality that there are still these various forms of violence and oppression that are going on? How are we to cope when we may still encounter police who see us as a stereotype? How are we to cope when we enter a doctor's office and we sense that somehow 
uh, we're uh, not being treated such as the person uh, before us or next to us who may not be of African descent. Uh, how are we to cope with the stress of the racism and oppression that surrounds us? How are we to cope when we also see it and we witness it being extended to other new refugee immigrant groups or other groups of the day that are popular targets for violence and oppression, such as Mexican Americans or Mexican immigrants? So let's see, how are we to cope? Next slide. And so it's about learning very practical skills for coping with the stress of racism and oppression. It's about shifting from maladaptive to adaptive responses to the stress of racism and oppression. And so how do each of us shift to the new paradigm of A equals B? How are we to learn a new set of ABCs? How are we to realize our humanity and can answer the question, who are you? I am someone who's able to engage with diverse and different others, with acceptance, with respect, with empathy. And how are we to ensure that we are following standard protocols? How are we to ensure that teacher training is such, that teachers standard follow protocols, that we move away some of, from some of our most absurd zero tolerance strategies in schools, so that children are not made to feel as though they are being seen as animals who need to be constrained, who need to be controlled, who need to be dominated, who need to respond to orders immediately or suffer consequences. How are we to also engage in the kind of training of our police officers so they are not expecting that it is the command and the talking down to others as though they are inferior that rules the day? and that instead they are to learn new ways of interacting. And so we need to have standard protocols in the field of medicine. Uh, one thing that has been done involves the use of checklists so that a nurse may be doing the checklist that as a physician is performing a procedure and the nurse has the power to call for the procedure to stop at the point at which the physician has deviated from the standard protocol. And so these are the kind of effective ways in which we may be able to assist each other so that it's just not us as an individual transforming our personal paradigms, shifting to the new paradigm. It's not just as individuals uh, who are seeking to transform our cognitions our behaviors and our affective reactions to others, that we are seeking to transform entire fields, entire professions, our colleagues. And so we need these kind of standard protocols. And in terms of our cognitions, we need cultural humility training, the idea that we have to get beyond these negative stereotypes and that we have to realize that uh, many factors operate in who an individual is. It's not just their cultural background, their race, it may be their religion, their level of education, and their preferences, that we have all of these things to consider. So it's also, from a cultural competence training perspective, impossible to reduce our various members of racial, ethnic, religious groups uh, to stereotypes, a new set of stereotypes that can be dangerous as well. Next slide. And so what are some examples of affective responses to racism and oppression? Well, there are those that are maladaptive, such as chronic anger, rage, helplessness. Uh, you know, there was a time when I used to um, go through um, a great deal of anger. And uh, I had to sing a song to myself. I basically adapted Teddy Pendergrass's song, I Think I Better Let It Go. <laughs> and so I would begin to sing, I Think I Better Let It Go, and I'm, I'm not a very good singer, so I won't share that with you. But the idea is that ah, that was my way of combining humor and creating my own adaptive response, my own adaptive response to the stress of racism and oppression. And I, I would argue that it was also a very selfish decision 
it really served to preserve my own heart and my own liver <laughs> and my internal organs. Because the, what we've learned from some of the pioneering work of Clark, Anderson, Clark, and Williams going back to 1999, that their transformative research really showed how when we enter into these chronic states uh, that involve psychological arousal, when they persist, we begin to experience ill health effects. We also experience physiological states of stimulation, and if they persist, they are also damaging. So we have to figure out what can we do to cease and desist when we've entered into a state of psychological arousal or physiological arousal. For me, I think I better let it go. I was walking down the road, I saw a toad, I said I think I better let it go, because I'm also not very good at remembering lyrics all the time. But the point is, is that all of us really need to think about how we may need to let go of our anger and also our feelings of helplessness that we may have. Uh, or also some of our feelings of paranoia, which sometimes are justified, but still there's a point where you gotta let it go. <laughs> and what about adaptive, adaptive affective states? Again, acceptance, to accept the reality of one's circumstances. And so it may very well be that you are facing circumstances that are not fair. They absolutely are not fair that because we're talking about a United States cultural violence, there are traditions and practices that have become a way of life, that have been passed down, passed down from group member to group member, from generation to generation. And so uh, that also kind of explains one of the things I used to do when I was in graduate school as a psychologist. I would regularly read the New York Times obituary section. And every time I saw that a psychologist had died, I was very happy because it meant that things were changing. The old order was giving way to the new. And so the reality may be that sometimes we have to accept that there are some things that are out of our control and there are some who are still representing the legacy of the generations and generations, 400 years, things that were encoded in religion that justify the enslavement of African Americans going back 400 years that there are things that were codified uh, in eugenics in terms of the history of psychology, my own field, which will help you understand why I didn't mind some people dying, in terms of propagating the misinformation and myths about intelligence tests, the immigrants who were turned away, not far from us, okay, uh, when they arrived in the port off of New York City and were deemed inferior intellectually and were sent back. So the idea is that there are many traditions that continue to be codified in forms of thought that many people embrace up to today. And so therefore, you may have to enter into a state of acceptance. Acceptance. And find a way. You know, recently, the National Institutes of Health uh, had the ad data analyzed just last October that indicated that uh, there were disparities in the awarding of grants with blacks receiving much li less likelihood of receiving a grant and it echoed what came out in 2011. Uh, and so this article was a little bit different in really in showing how, you know, there were some grants that don't even make it to the table to get reviewed. And then there are various steps in the process so that uh, the blacks uh, research scientists, the black research scientists end up having their grants eliminated. Uh, and uh, so what do you do? What do you do when you are a researcher in this kind of environment? Uh, that article was not out in 1995 when I was experiencing those kind of barriers to funding. And so what do you do? Those articles weren't out in 2003 when I decided to start the research group on disparities in health. And so acceptance, to accept that uh, this door is, seems to be closed. I've knocked, knock, knock, knock. Who's there? Blackface. Blackface who? Oh, you. Forget about it. <laughs> 
You're not getting the grant. All right. And so as water, what does water do? Water flows around obstacles. Water flows around rocks. And so when starting the research group on disparities in health, I considered myself using an African technology. And that African technology was the communal group approach. So that as opposed to individual level advisement, we would do group advisement. And therefore, I also created my own group of colleagues, colleague collaborating researchers, such that between 2003 and the year 2019, and with the assistance of my beloved colleague, who you will hear shortly, Dr. Robert Fullylove, from 2003 to 2019, I was the sponsor for the research group on disparities in health of 120 doctoral students. So how to make a way when there is no way? That is what adaptive coping is all about. And it's to accept the fundamental conditions of one's existence and then to be creative in other ways. So there's also the behavioral domain. So how do you cope with this stress? Go to the next slide. So of course my behavior uh, was to start the research group on disparities in health. But what is a maladaptive behavioral response? You know, I think I, I remember hearing, uh, maybe you did too, maybe it was a, uh, over a decade ago, uh, where there was a, a video camera that had captured a black professor, like, you know, kicking a wall. <laughs> Something like that. Anybody hear that story? It was, it was quite a while ago. <coughs> well, um, I can understand. <coughs> but you also might hurt your foot. And so the idea is that that's maladaptive. Any kind of verbal and physical aggression, alcohol, drug use, overeating, isolation, what is adaptive? Seeking out social support, having, learning how to engage in a positive, assertive verbal response, using humor as well, exercise, meditation, yoga. But it may very well be, it may very well be that also adaptive is to walk away is to get up and leave. Um, I'm reminded of one of my students' uh, research, uh, and in the qualitative course, she was talking about how um, African-American college students coped with the stress of racism and oppression. And in this regard, there was one little quote that was very powerful where a student was talking about how she was going to leave the university because she just could not take it anymore, which of course, is most unfortunate because we would hope that instead she would seek out social support. But it's to realize that what was also documented was the increase in rhetoric because partly because of Donald Trump's rhetoric, it seems as though people feel more free to say things that constitute verbal harassment and abuse. As my students so analyze it, I'll put the blame on her, okay? Uh, and so those options are much more uh, desirable of seeking out social support. And so, of course, the recommendations talked about the need for counseling, more counselors, et cetera. But if we go to the next slide. So what are some examples of cognitive responses to racism and oppression? Well, there are a lot of them that are maladaptive, so I won't repeat, but I would simply summarize it with some humor. One maladaptive response is, let them have it, okay? Or I can't. And let's contrast that with let go. My singing, I think I better let it go. Or uh, what's known in 12-step tradition, let go and let God, or I can, or I will, or I am able, or in the case water will find a way that you can make a way when there is no way, or so it seems. And now let's go to the next slide. So this is uh, obviously evidence that I am a true nerd, <laughs> which you should all know stands for N, newly, E, empowered, R, revolutionary, D, developer. So as a newly empowered, revolutionary developer, 
this basically explains how in the psychology of liberation, there's also a psychology of identity development. And so one of the ways that we may need to cope is to heal our identities because we talked about how through the spreading of misinformation and myths, we can have damage to our uh, self-concept, our uh, identity, our affects, our consciousness. And so if we just um, look at the cognitions on the right side, well, we can actually start at the top. Affects, how many of us end up feeling having negative feelings toward our own racial group. Uh, and some of us even engage in behavior that reflects preference for the dominant race. I think we, we have seen some of that. Uh, and then we can also talk about having negative cognitions regarding one's own race or one's group. It may seem inevitable. Let's go to the next slide so it's just a little bit bigger. Uh, and we can talk about how there are those who uh, perhaps having advanced a bit in this area, may feel confusion, ambivalence, or determined to explore something new. How important is it for individuals to engage in the behavior of reading, of talking, of seeking out new avenues for learning about one's identity, and resolving any conflicting cognitions, and making a decision to explore identity issues by taking action? Might you take uh, a cruise down the Nile and visit Egypt? and take your son and achieve education in that way that begins to heal wounds to identity. And in an action stage, you actually, where you actually are taking action to heal your identity and to develop an identity that's going to support your healing and function effectively in this society. Uh, here you might have feelings of acceptance of one's own race and culture. And hopefully we are raising children in such a way that this is automatic, that there's no 13, 21-year-old who has to explore these issues, although it may very well be, but hopefully we can all have the awareness that parenting requires that children are growing up with acceptance of their race and culture. Uh, we can talk about the historic doll studies and how replications have found black children have selected, you know, which is the pretty doll, which is the bad doll, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but can we raise them in such a way that they are not having some of these negative feelings toward their dominant, toward their own culture. Uh, and of course, with all of the media influences, it may still be impossible. Their parents who felt as though they had raised their children in such a way, yet uh, that child may have participated in doll study and may have chosen uh, the black as, you know, which, which, which doll is bad, which doll is good, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we need behavior that shows that we're exploring our own culture uh, and we need new cognitions that reflect our new knowledge and then ultimately we emerge in a very stable state having feelings of pride, fulfillment, self-confidence, acceptance and respect of others. We're engaged in stable behavior that reflects interacting with your own personal as well as dominant culture. You're respectful of behavior of others and of course your cognitions are stable and then ultimately you have feelings of peace, altruism, and most importantly, a desire to engage in social action for social justice. Your personal transformation and your personal healing is just not for your own personal edification and advancement, although that might help you pay the rent, but ultimately, it's about advocacy. It's about advocacy, advocating for changes in social policy. Do you know that it took 25 years of persistent advocacy involving a coalition such as the Drug Alliance, Mothers Against Mandatory Minimums. Uh, in other words, it took 25 years of evidence-based advocacy to change the policy that was embedded in the 1985 and 1986 Drug Abuse Acts. It wasn't until the year 2011 that instead of a 100 to 1 ratio for how much powder cocaine you'd have to trigger the same mandatory minimum sentence as if you had, were in possession of crack, it was changed to 18 to 1. Okay, so we're still a little bit upset. But the idea is that it took 25 years of advocacy to have that policy change. And today we are advocating to move away from war on drugs policy and to move toward public health policy. And of course, there are those who see that shift happening at a time of the opioid epidemic 
and are a bit concerned, but you know, if you see uh, two adults overdosed in a Walmart parking lot off of heroin with two children in the back of the car, it seems to trigger more of a public health approach as opposed to a war on drugs criminalization approach, meaning finally addiction treatment before incarceration, although there may still be loss of child custody, et cetera. So the idea is social action for social justice, advocacy, and ultimately, those humanistic feelings of which I spoke. Who are you? Are you someone who can experience acceptance for all of the diverse and different others? Can you experience respect? Can you experience empathy for the children in cages? Can you experience uh, empathy for the Sandra Blands? Can you experience empathy for the 10-year-old girls being slammed to the ground in their elementary school classrooms? Can you feel empathy? And can you, because of your humanism, engage in social action for social justice? We are just not educating people here at Teachers College or any place, I would hope, without there being the outcome of individuals appreciating the imperative upon you to engage in advocacy for social policy change, even if it takes 25 years, even if it means collaborating with the United States Sentencing Commission who are providing you with the data you need to show the disproportionate incarceration of blacks compared to whites. Persistent evidence-based advocacy for policy change. And so these behaviors constitute social action for social justice, they're humanistic behaviors, and your cognitions reflect value for your own personal and the dominant culture. So it's not, we're not gonna reenact A over B. Yeah. You know, a lot of people have kind of been bewildered historically. It's like, oh, you know, um, for example, in South Africa, apartheid, you know, oh, what's gonna happen now that, you know, blacks are in power, you know, or are we gonna suffer revenge? And ultimately, it's about discovering that, no, it's about humanistic behaviors. It's about humanistic feelings. And it's about valuing your personal culture as well as that of everyone else. Next slide. So, this is an appeal to you. This is a call to action. This is a call for all of us to learn how to engage in self-observation, in self-monitoring. Can you observe the moment at which you see someone who is diverse and different and you are a socially conditioned animal, unlike, not too much different from, you know, uh, a cat in Skinner's box, and you have a negative stereotype pop into your head. The charge to you is to be able to observe the moment at which that occurs. It's not too different from the week after Thanksgiving when the image of macaroni and cheese pops into your head, <laughs> or apple pie or sweet potato pie, and you have to stop yourself and say, no, I'm not going to the kitchen. I am not going to the kitchen. <laughs> and so, in a similar way, are you able to self-observe and self-monitor the moment when a negative stereotype, when the remnants of your participation and being a part of this US cultural violence emerges and you catch yourself in the act of thinking a negative stereotype? And can you direct yourself and distract yourself? And instead, might you engage in an adaptive cognition and if the opportunity is there to interact with someone who is diverse and different, are you able to say, I seek to know you. I seek to ask, to inquire, and to listen. My goal is cultural humility. If we can ask uh, those who are obese and overweight, who have to watch commercials all day long of food, if we ask them to exercise restraint and to stop themselves, if we are asking those who are addicted to opioids who still have to return to environments where they may have to drive by the same corner where they used to purchase heroin, or they've got to go see the same doctor who prescribed them Oxycontin. <laughs> 
And they've got to exercise the kind of control where they direct themselves to think something else other than, here's $20. Could I get another prescription for Oxy? <laughs> okay. Or it's time to go for a walk instead of overeating. How can we not ask the same of ourselves, which is to rise and fulfill the highest level of our humanity, where as human beings, we can answer the question, who are you? And the answer is, I'm someone capable of acceptance, respect, and empathy for all the diverse and different others. And I am helping to transform, in the 21st century, our US cultural violence into something else. And collectively, we will create it and see what it ends up being. Thank you very much. OK. You want to give them your PowerPoint. Right. OK, so because uh, we're having a PowerPoint loaded, um, I could probably take uh, at least two questions, even though we're having a panel discussion at the very end. Anybody have a question or a comment? Okay, so I'm gonna ask one of you gentlemen. Who's gonna represent your group? Who's gonna stand up and ask a question? Come on, sir. No, no, oh, okay, yeah, you give it to him, sure. So we have, and we're gonna empower our youth, yes. Um, hi, um, I'm Matthias Nixon and me and my group are from Eagle Academy of Young Men of Brooklyn. Um, do you have a question or anything? No, just a little louder. There was a little noise up there, so I was trying oh, to. Um, hi, um, I'm Matthias. Um, me and my group are from Eagle Academy of Young Men of Brooklyn. Um, Welcome. Let's give them a hand. Welcome. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yes. Oh, so my question is, like, how are we going to instill um, cultural humility in our school? Because, like, we as students really want to learn things, but, like, we can't, we, we can't really comprehend a lot of the things that we, as black men, are trying to use our knowledge for. Like, a lot of people say that, like, oh, math is not really going to help us, science is not gonna, really going to help us. We want to learn how to, how to actually work, do jobs, pay taxes, and whatnot. But I just want to see, like, how, how can we, how can we learn much more than what our core standards are supposed to be? Well, I guess that's why uh, someone deemed this opportunity as a worthwhile endeavor so that you're not in your seventh period class right now. That instead you took the long trip up here to Teachers College. And so, so that's one thing, that we express gratitude for that. And so it's to look for opportunities such as this. And with, um, you know, there, there are some aspects of social media that are rather distasteful, but there also are videos on YouTube, for example, that can provide an education such as this. For example, we had seven annual health disparities conferences, and just about all the videos are on YouTube. Uh, so the idea is that uh, if we go back to some of those stages of your identity development, the responsibility is also on you. In other words, uh, what about that one hour you have on Saturday morning between finishing up your cereal and deciding what you're gonna do for the rest of your day? You know, is that an hour that you spend reading a book? Um, the other interesting thing is that, you know, you save two hours. Uh, it used to be the recommendation to go to the library. Well, today, there's so many things that are accessible online. Uh, so uh, even if it's a, a group uh, of eight young men who begin to create a reading list, uh, and as a matter of fact, I think you could even Google recommended reading lists for black youth. <laughs> And you're going to find a list of books that are credible, that will allow you to begin to develop your identity as a black man, that will allow you to also appreciate that uh, in between all the things you have to do, that there can be value in a group saying, OK, well, you know, there's the chess club, there's the debate club, you know, there's basketball, there's football, but there's also this 45-minute period where with the 
um, faculty sponsor perhaps even brought us here, we could have a group discussion group. And there are people such as Dr. Robert Fullylove who are among you know, uh, the most giving and the most willing to come to school auditoriums. You know, there, there are some individuals who, you know, they don't go anywhere unless they're getting, you know, $3,000, $5,000. And then there were those who were down south among some of the protests that began in the civil rights area, like Dr. Robert Fully Love, who are enthralled by an opportunity to talk to eight black youth. And he's not alone, although he's a rarity. Mm -hmm. So those are just a couple of suggestions, but I would say that part of what you need to know is that, do you realize that if you go to a high school that does not offer certain math classes, when you start that school in ninth grade, you do not know that the door has been closed on medical school completely. And so that's why, you know, some of those math classes are so important because you may not be the person in 11th grade that you were in eighth grade and by 11th grade, you might want to go to medical school. But if you didn't go to a high school that had certain math classes, the door closed without you even knowing it. So I hope that begins to answer uh, your question. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. And, and let's give them another hand for making the trip. We're incredibly proud of you.